We're going to be studying 1 Peter chapters 2 and 3 tonight. And uh, to start things off, I'll open with prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for any time that we can study your word. The light to our path that it is. The fact that you preserved it to us so that we can see examples of what's good. Sometimes examples of what's not. And that we can learn how to live life as you would have us live. Most especially, we thank you for Jesus Christ, your Son, and all that he did for us, God. Some of which we're going to see tonight. We thank you for these things, and I thank you for these men for their taking the time to be here. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Okay, so, 1 Peter, just by way of a little bit of review, was, um, this is the timeline of the New Testament. We looked at it last week, but just to give you a general idea of when um, 1 Peter was written, it's over in the like 60 to 65 AD time frame. Um, for reference, Jesus Christ probably was crucified. His passion, so to speak, was in about 33 or thereabouts, depending on how you date things. So the time from, and remember Peter, which we saw some last week, Peter was with Jesus Christ during his entire earthly ministry. And then not only saw the rise of the early church, but then also um, all of the persecutions that went with that. Um, so, he's in active Christian ministry and Christian service for about 30 years before he writes first and second Peter. And that's why I wanted to point out this time frame. Um, and as we look, as you look back on your own life, and I look back on mine, I think of how long I've been a Christian, what I have done, what I haven't done, that sort of thing. Think about that in the context of Peter being 30 years essentially 30 years in ministry, 30 years in, for the first uh, probably 15 years of the first century church, he was essentially the leader of the church. By the time we see Acts 15 roll around, which is the first church council, which actually happens um, just as a benchmark, chronologically it happens in 49 AD. Right? So that's when the first church council occurs. So it's something like uh, 15, 18 years or something like that after Christ is crucified, buried, raised, raised from the dead, is, ascends, all that stuff happens. Um, Peter, by that time, is not actually the leader of the church. You may remember from Acts 15, when they're talking about the whole Mosaic Law and how the Gentiles would be impacted by that, which was the major reason for the church council in the first place. When they come to a conclusion, Peter talks in that meeting of elders and apostles and Paul about how his ministry to the Jews, but then that the Gentiles you know, came in, so to speak. But the person who makes the final pronouncement there is James. He's the one who speaks last, and he's the one who then says, we're going to send this letter to the brethren. So by the time of 49 AD, Peter's not the leader of the church anymore. But up until then, even through Acts 12, you may remember James is killed. You know that James and John James is killed. And they throw Peter in prison. If you haven't read that record recently, that record is in, we didn't read it last week, but it is an absolute riot. In any case, um, even then, Peter is still the de facto leader of the church. So for 15 years, he's the leader of the church, and he sees the persecutions. Remember, Paul's martyr. He knows what's happening with Paul. He mentions Paul in 2 Timothy, or in 2 Peter. And um, he also sees the persecutions, that, and he mentions this a number of times in 1 Peter, but he sees the persecutions that are happening at various places. Nero, who's the emperor who martyrs Paul in the first place, it's remembered during his reign, and this is recorded historically. I mean, this is not, <laughs> this is not hearsay. There's a, a Roman historian by the name of Tacitus, or Tacitus, depending on how you pronounce the C, um, who records what Nero did with Christians, and I mean literally setting them on fire and using them in torches in his gardens. I'm not kidding you about that. And that would, of course, have been no. I mean, Peter, as I mentioned last week, was historically, traditionally, uh, crucified, martyred himself. So he sees all this stuff. And, and that formulates Peter before we get to 1st and 2nd Peter. Now let's, um, and I just want to remind you, 
He's writing to these people in Pontus, Cappadocia, Galatia, Cilicia, Bithynia. He's in Asia, right in that area, right? Remember, and he mentions, when he mentions Paul in 2 Peter, he mentions um, Paul writing to them. And remember, there was a church in Galatia. We obviously have that letter to the Galatians, right? So, um, they were, um, and, and to remind you of one other thing, and that is when Peter writes this, and he mentions this in 1 Peter chapter 5, he's in Babylon at the time. He's not in Jerusalem, he's in Babylon. Some Bible students have looked at that reference to Babylon in 1 Peter and think that it is symbolic and it really refers to Rome and that Peter was in Rome when he wrote this epistle. But there's no evidence Peter was ever in Rome. Which is interesting when the Roman Catholic Church traces the papacy, the Pope, to Peter. Peter was never there, or at least there is no significant evidence that he was ever there. So, anyway. Um, nor was he settled. What's that? Nor was he settled. Yes, and that's, that's another interesting thing. Um, Peter's, we didn't read about this, but Peter's mother-in-law was healed by Jesus Christ. So, clearly... Peter was married. Why they chose to um, make all of the clergy in the Roman Catholic Church celibate, I'm sure there's a history of that, but, but it was a really stupid thing to do. Whoever did it, whenever they did it, it was really dumb. In any case, let's read 1 Peter chapter 2 together, and then we'll look at several things in there. We'll first read chapter 2, and then we'll look at chapter 3. So, chapter 2, I'll be reading in the New King James. So, therefore, laying aside all malice, all deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and all evil speaking, as newborn babes desire the, sense, the pure milk of the word, that you may grow thereby, if indeed you have tasted that the Lord is gracious. Coming to him as to a living stone, rejected indeed by men, but chosen by God and precious, you also as living stones, are being built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood, to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Therefore it is also contained in the scripture, Behold, I lay in thine, a chief cornerstone, elect, precious, and he who believes on him will, be, will by no means be put to shame. Therefore to you who believe he is precious, but to those who are disobedient, the stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone and a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. They stumble, being disobedient to the word, to which they also were appointed. But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light, who once were not a people, but are now the people of God, who had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. Beloved, I beg you as sojourners and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lusts which war against the soul, having your conduct honorable among the Gentiles, that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may, by your good works which they observe, glorify God in the day of visitation. Therefore submit yourselves to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake, whether to the king as supreme, or to governors, as to those who are sent by him for the punishment of evildoers, and for the praise of those who do good. For this is the will of God, that by doing good you may put to silence the ignorance of foolish men, as free, yet not using liberty as a cloak for vice, but as bondservants of God. Honor all people, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the king. Servants, be submissive to your masters with all fear, not only to the good and gentle, but also to the harsh. For this is commendable, if, because of conscience toward God, one endures grief, suffering wrongfully. For what credit is it if, when you are beaten for your faults, you take it patiently? But when you do good and suffer, if you take it patiently, this is commendable before God. For to this you were called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that you should follow his steps, who committed no sin, nor was deceit found in his mouth, who, when he was reviled, did not revile in return, when he suffered, he did not threaten, but committed himself to him who judges righteously, who himself bore our sins in his own body on the tree, that we, having died to sins, might live for righteousness, by whose stripes you were healed. For you were 
like sheep going astray, but have now returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. Let's look at a couple things in uh, chapter 2. First, the, uh, that sincere milk of the word is our sincere, sincere milk of the word that you may grow thereby. Um, and I think the, the New King James, I'm quoting the King James, but uh, because it says sincere, I think this says pure. Is our pure milk of the word. The thing that, obviously this is important. I don't need to state that it's important to study God's word. Obviously I don't need to do that. However, Peter apparently did think that it was important. Paul thought it was important to Timothy at the end of his life to say, study to show yourself approved unto God, or that he's not to be ashamed rather than writing more the truth. Um, I was very blessed by um, Pastor David's recent sharing about Psalm 44 when he brought up 2 Timothy 2.15. Because one thing that blessed me was he actually showed the King James, which I love. But that wasn't the real reason. The real reason was um, the nuance of the word study as it's translated in the King James Version. It says the King James translates study to show thyself a proof unto God. The word, and, but the New King James says be diligent. Right? I mean, that's the way they translate it, be diligent. Because the word study in 1611 meant be diligent. It just so happens that it's convenient that we have to study God's Word, and the King James says study. But the point is, the nuance of that word, one, um, oh, I, a, he was a preacher I heard a long time ago, but he was um, commenting on the, the specific meaning of this word, and he said really what this word means is the Greek, if you want to look at it, it's the Greek word skudatso, right? And he said it really means to put forth a diligent effort with attention to the fact that you have limited time. We have limited time. What's the limited time? Christ is going to return. <laughs> or, um, we've seen that again and again and again in, in Ecclesiastes, that Solomon, because he didn't have an eternal viewpoint, his end point was just on the earth. For us, the end point is Jesus Christ is going to return. When he comes back, we're going to see him face to face. Whether we're alive at the time and we're changed, or we're dead and we're resurrected. But that's the end point when we see him face to face. So, study to show that self-approved unto God is be diligent with attention to the fact that you have a short time. Time is not an unlimited commodity. Um, and Paul thought that was important as one of the last things he tells Timothy. Right? Second Timothy is the last communication of Paul. The last thing he told Timothy before he was normal, before he was martyred. So he must have felt that study to show that self-approved unto God was important. He must have felt that all scripture given by expression of God was important because he specifically mentions it in 2 Timothy. But the thing that I thought of really is um, 2 Timothy 4.13. Okay, now, 2 Timothy um, was, as I mentioned, Paul's last communication. It was written between the imprisonment that we see recorded at the end of the book of Acts and another imprisonment that is not recorded but that happened after that, right? When Paul was actually martyred. So the point is, we let's turn to 2 Timothy chapter 4. We'll come back to Peter, obviously. We turn to 2 Timothy chapter 4. We'll look at just a couple verses here. Because this struck me regarding um, the desire for God's word. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse. Uh, Six, for I am already being poured out as a drink offering. This is New King James. And the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Finally, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me on that day, and not to me only, but also to all those that, that love his appearing. And then he says in verse 9, Be diligent to come to me quickly. Now clearly, there is an urgency in Paul's mind. His time is short. He said that. He wants Timothy to come to him quickly. Timothy was his, I guess, most trusted associate. Um, you may remember in Philippians when he says, you know, but I hope to send Timothy to you shortly. And then he says, um, he says, for I have no man like-minded who will naturally care for your state. For all men seek their own and not the things which are Jesus Christ's. Timothy was that guy. So he wanted Timothy to come to him quickly. But then look what he says in verse 13. Bring the cloak that I left with Carpus at Troas when you come, and the books, 
especially the parchments. Now, the significance of parchments was that parchments were, were animal skin manuscripts. And they were probably Old Testament manuscripts. So what he was asking for was the Bible. No, there were books, he says that, but then um, the Greek word that's translated here for uh, parchments is memramus. Mem we get the English word memory, they were skins, right? So they were probably Old Testament manuscripts. Even at the end of Paul's life, when he has limited time, when he may never even see this stuff, the Timothy's going to bring it. The important thing was, especially the parchments. That's how important God's word was to him. And that's what Peter says here to desire the pure milk of the world. Uh, Peter goes on to, in 1 Peter 2, he goes on to talk about being a chosen people. And I wanted to, if you look up here, we'll read Exodus 19.5. Now therefore, if you will obey my voice indeed and keep my covenant, then you shall be a peculiar treasure unto me above all people, for all the earth is mine. And you shall be unto me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation, these are the words which thou shalt speak unto the children of Israel. Now, in the Old Testament, in Exodus, Israel was that chosen people. Peter, in 1 Peter chapter 2, expands that to the Gentiles got in the door. But the point is, or what I want to point out to you about this, is God starts Exodus 19.5 out with, Now therefore, if you will obey my voice in thee. How critical is our behavior, how we act and how we speak, to what kind of a relate to, to how God can use us. You see that he was going to make them a peculiar nation above all people if they obeyed. If they didn't obey, that wasn't going to work. How could God use them, how could God employ them for his purposes dependent on how they acted? Because that's what Exodus 19.5 says. If they didn't do that, he couldn't, they wouldn't be a chosen nation. If you don't obey, and we see that same thing in other, um, other places as well, and we'll look at that. Uh, the next, uh, he talks in uh, 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 11. He says, uh, Beloved, I beg you as sojourners and pilgrims. And um, it made me think of Colossians chapter 3, verses 1 and 2. If ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God, set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. And then it goes on to say, I didn't put this up in the overhead, and then it goes on to say, for you, you are dead. The King James says, for ye are dead, and the life is hid with Christ in God. And the Greek actually says, for you died. Now, the point being, we didn't die, but we died in, in so far as we identify with Christ, we died when Christ died. We were resurrected when Christ was resurrected. We ascended when Christ ascended. And that's why he can say, you know, seek those things which are above where Christ sits on the right hand of God. That's where our country should be, in heaven, not on earth. So, and what an interesting thing about this secular affection. And I don't, um, I didn't read this, I used King James for my overheads just because that's easier for me. What does the New King James say here, you, or any other translation you have? What does it say for secular affection? Does it, how does it translate that? On it's Colossians three two, Colossians three two. Secular affection. Set your mind. On Set your mind. Set your mind. All right. The reason I, I uh, the, the Greek words used really mean exercise your mind in the, the tense. And if you wanted to look at something this specific, um, the tense of it is is to keep on doing this. In other words, it's an action that you continue to do. Keep on thinking about it. It's also a command. It's not an option. <laughs> this is what we're supposed to do. This is like when you're little and your dad says, "Go clean your room." This is a command. It's imperative. It's not an option. We're not supposed to optionally set our things on our, our minds on things above. <laughs> we're supposed to set our minds on things above, and we're supposed to do it continually. That's not optional. That's a command. Now, not that we always follow through and do that, but it's a command that we do. Um, the strangers and pilgrims idea mainly 
again, made me think of Colossians chapter 3 because our citizenship is in heaven. As of when Jesus Christ ascended, we went with him. As far as God is concerned, our citizenship is in heaven. So we need to be thus minded when we're here on earth. We need to be thus minded that our citizenship is up there, not down here. We're, there's a great old hymn uh, called this, uh, or, uh, some of the words when this world is not my home, I'm just a passing through. Right? Because that's really what we're doing. We're just passing through. We're on our way to meet Jesus Christ when he comes back, and then we're with him forever. That's what 1 Thessalonians 4, 1 Corinthians 15 says. Um, and then in 1 uh, Peter 2.11, when it talks about <coughs> the latter part of the verse, says, uh, Abstain from fleshly lusts which war against the soul. Uh, we're not going to read all of Romans chapter 7, but this is what Romans chapter 7 is about. Um, Romans chapter 7 is about the old nature uh, in, a, in a believer, in a person who comes to Jesus Christ as the Lord and Savior, and the new nature. There's an old and there's a new, and there's a battle between them. And Paul the Apostle writes about this in Romans 7, and comes to a conclusion in Romans 7, 18, says, In thee that is in my flesh dwelleth no good thing, for to will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good I find not. There is a battle, like Peter talks about. Like Galatians, the other verse I thought of was Galatians 5, 16 and 17. Uh, this is Paul again. This I say then, walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusts against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary, the one to the other, so that you cannot do the things that you would. Another way to translate that last portion, that you may not keep on doing whatever you wish. Right? Which means, Christianity... I mean, coming to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ is frequently, I will just say, it's a momentary thing. But becoming a Christian is not. Becoming a Christian is, you may not keep on doing whatever you wish. There's a change involved. Of course God is going to help change us. But like we saw in Exodus 19.5, you're going to be a peculiar nation if you do what I tell you to do. Right? You're going to be a Christian as long as you don't keep on doing whatever you like. Because Jesus Christ being Lord, being boss, that is a process that takes real work and real effort. Being Savior is, well, if you'll pardon the expression, a get out of hell free card. That's a different story. So, but first, uh, Peter 2.11, when he talks about that battle, uh, again, we're not going to read Romans 7. Romans 7 is just... You can see in Paul the Apostle, you can just see the Christianity just erupting when he writes Romans 7. And the battle that he sees in himself. And then he's communicating to the believers that this is going to happen, right? I'm Paul the Apostle, and it happens to me, for heaven's sake. <laughs> so, just a, it's a great chapter. Um, so, and this is also on 1 uh, Peter 2.11. And this is just about... It also made me think of Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, mainly because of the idea communicated in Romans 12, 1 and 2 of conforming to the world. Um, and one of the better examples of conforming to the world, how many people remember what Silly Putty is? So Silly Putty, you may remember, I, I don't know what you guys did, when I was a little, take a lot of Silly Putty and they'd have a newspaper on the table, put it on the newspaper, and just leave it there and walk away. You come back, I don't know, hour or two or something, peel it off, and you have an exact replica of whatever was on that newspaper. I mean, like, exact. Exactly what was there. So that is a great practical definition of what Romans 12, 1 and 2 talk about when it says, be not conformed to this world. Be not conformed to this world, but be transformed. That word transformed, you may know, is the Greek word metamorphoso. It's a, we get metamorphosis from it, like a butterfly goes from a caterpillar to a butterfly. That's the kind of change. Do we always experience that dramatic change in our Christian lives? Maybe not immediately, but hopefully ultimately we do. Um, but Romans 12, 1 and 2, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. That word reasonable is the Greek word logikos. It's the logical thing to do. <laughs> to serve God is the logical thing to do because of all that he did for us. And be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind.
mind, you may prove what is that good and acceptable before the will of God. The only other point I want to make with this verse is what, and not saying that people are in this alone, but based on what this verse says, what is the engine for change? In verse 2, what's supposed to change? What's going to initiate change? No, well, maybe I'm not saying it. In verse 2, how, how are we, maybe I should say, how are we going to be changed? Being transformed by renewing of your mind. Now, I am not saying that an individual is in this alone and that they're becoming more Christ-like entirely on their own. But I am saying this is our part. God specifically tells us, you do this. Right? You be transformed by the way. You be changed by the renewing of your mind. You change your mind. God does not change our minds for us. Now this is always a Philippians 2, like 12 and 13 situation. Um, work out your own salvation for God works in. But this is the work out your own salvation part. This is the we got to be transformed part. This is the first Peter 2, don't walk in the lust of the flesh that war against the spirit. And that's why these verses I think are you know, pertaining. Um, the other thing I wanted to check to cover in this chapter is 1 Peter 2.24. Uh, which is, it talks about the sufferings of Christ. And the, the idea of suffering comes up at different times in 1 Peter. And, um, I mean, he talks about, like when he tells the servants to not only, oh God, he tells the servants to, it's the servants be submissive to your masters with all fear, not only to the good and gentle, but also to the harsh. That's what the King James says. The word harsh <laughs> is the Greek word skolios. What it means is crooked. So, you're supposed to obey not only the good ones, but the crooked ones. Because that's what that word means. Right? Now, that's a tall order. That's right up there with um, husbands love your wives, wives like Christ loved the church and love your enemies. That's a tall order. That's hard to do. Um, but the, and he also goes on to say in those following verses about suffering. And when you suffer for having done good, that's commendable to God. Now, I'm going to just be straight up with you. I'm not there. But it doesn't diminish the truth of Scripture. It doesn't change what Peter said. It also points out the fact that the people to whom he is writing were apparently dealing with this on a fairly regular basis because it comes up more than once about the idea of suffering and suffering for the gospel. And then he uses Christ as the example, which is how we get to 1 Peter 2.24. Um, so let's just look at 2.23 first. Who, when he was reviled, this is Jesus Christ, who, when he was reviled, reviled not again. When he suffered, he threatened not, but committed himself to him that judge, judgeth righteously. Now, please remember, Peter was the eyewitness to these things. He saw all this. He's not writing from reading something else or something he heard from somebody else. He watched this. He was he denied Christ three times, and Christ was in eye shot after the third time. Right? He saw the sufferings. He saw how Jesus Christ responded. He is speaking from experience, and it's important, I think, to remember that when we read these verses. But again, a little nuance here of um, the Greek language had a past tense that was kind of a simple past action, but it also had a past tense that indicated that you did something repeatedly in the past. These words that are translated revile not again, threaten not, and then committed himself, they're all in that past tense that indicates that he kept doing them, that it wasn't a one-time action. Remember, Christ was beaten. I mean, you, you know, the, the crown of thorns, the beating by the Roman soldiers, the they're nailing them to the cross and then forgiving right afterwards, saying, Father, forgive them, so they don't know what they do. And again, Peter was an eyewitness to all these things. So when we read these verses, we have to remember that what was Peter, what do you think was going through his mind when he wrote this stuff? Because he recalled this 30 years before. Amazing. But then we get to verse, uh, 1 Peter 2.24, who his own self, Jesus Christ, bear our sins in his own body on the tree, that we being dead to sins should
should live unto righteousness, by whose stripes you were healed. That is a quotation, rough quotation from Isaiah 53, 5, which says, But he was wounded for our transgressions, he was bruised for our iniquities, the chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. Now, Isaiah 53, 5 was written something like 700 years before Christ. And if you look at the very bottom of this overhead, Young's literal translation, I'm not good enough with Hebrew to translate Hebrew literally and tell you about tenses and stuff. I am with Greek, but I'm not with Hebrew. So this is the closest I can get to what would be a literal translation. So we'll just read this. And he is pierced for our transgressions, bruised for our iniquities, that chastisement of our peace is on him, and by his bruise there is healing to us. Now notice all those verbs are present tense. There is healing to us. And yet, it was written 700 years before Jesus Christ was on the earth. Then you look at the tense in 1 Peter 2.24, by whose stripes you were healed. So Isaiah looks forward to the Messiah, and Peter looks back to the accomplished work of Messiah. Isaiah looks forward even though Messiah's work was not accomplished, but God considered it in the present tense. <laughs> like a present tense reality. Um, and again, the reason I point this out is, we'll look at uh, 1 Corinthians 11, that I think that communion, this is simply me, but I, I think that Christians today many times fall into the same boat that the Corinthians did, which Paul corrected in 1 Corinthians chapter 11 by not discerning the Lord's body and blood. They don't realize the significance of it. They don't realize the suffering it went through and the significance of the broken body and the shed blood. And that's why they're essentially, you know, it's sort of an empty exercise. Even for Christians who are Christians. Here's why I say that. Let's just read 1 Corinthians 11, 27 through 30. This is Paul writing to the Corinthians. And you can read it in the chapter. They were really out to lunch with this. I mean, we're talking like one person's drunk, in other words, another person's gluttonous. You know, don't you have houses to eat and drink in? When you come together for the Lord's Supper, let's do the Lord's Supper. Let's not be gluttons and drunkards. Okay, so they were out to lunch. However, let's just read these verses. Therefore, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner shall be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. But a man must examine himself, and in so doing he is to eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For he who eats and drinks, eats and drinks judgment to himself, if he does not judge the body rightly. Verse 30, the consequence of not judging the body rightly. For this reason, many among you are weak and sick, and a number sleep. So what was the consequence of not judging the Lord's body correctly? Sickness and death. So how powerful is communion if the consequence of not acknowledging its significance is sickness and death? Because that's what Paul says. And I think a lot of Christianity, I don't know, Make it over. This is totally just my opinion. I think a lot of Christianity is in that boat. They just don't recognize the significance of the broken body and the shed blood and what it really means to our daily lives. And what can happen when we take communion. What we're celebrating, you know, of that broken body and the shed blood, who's own self bear our sins and the own body and the tree. We being dead to sins and live under righteous. By whose stripes we were healed. When Christ was beaten, we were healed. That's what Isaiah 53 5 says. That's what 1 Peter 2.24 says. Now, to get there, just like Exodus 19.5, if you obey, you're a peculiar nation. Romans 12.1 and 2, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. There's, a, there's an hour part of that. You know, the man, according to this, for he who eats and drinks, eats and drinks judgment to himself. Let a man examine himself. That's our job. That's not anybody else's job. And that's what 1 Peter 2.24 Okay, so um, let's want to sit, stand up for a couple of minutes. Does that work? You want to? Yeah. Let's stand up for a couple of minutes, maybe two, and then we'll do chapter three. Okay. <coughs> Well, if you ever do anything in the tenses, that's the, that repeated action in the past, that's the yeah. reason for the tenses. 
Right. It can it can be just um, exegetically, it's just fabulous sometimes. Oh, absolutely. <coughs> yeah, I think it's really helpful to read the inside you stuff you've got. There. I do not, actually. I do not. What? You should. Better? We'll do. Like in Acts, thank you. Like in Acts, uh, in Acts 16, when um, Paul and Silas start singing praises and it says the prisoners heard them, that's in the imperfect tense. Which means Paul and Silas were singing for a while because they're just listening. Yeah. <laughs> you don't bother me. They were in hey, style. Yeah. What's up with these guys? <laughs> they were in style. Yeah, exactly. In the inner person, when they're singing. Kingdom and these prisoners are just listening. I could have said that. Like, for the amount of this man to be in stock. Like, yeah. You know how irritating that is? It's like you got to scratch your face or something. You're just sitting there singing. Absolutely. <laughs> okay, let's go ahead and start. I don't want to keep you guys too late. So, we're going to read 1 Peter chapter 3 together now. And again, I'll read from the New King James. Wives, likewise, be submissive to your own husbands, that even if some do not obey the word, they without a word may be won by the conduct of their wives, when they observe your chaste conduct accompanied by fear. Do not let your adornment be merely outward, arranging the hair, wearing gold, or putting on fine apparel. Rather, let it be the hidden person of the heart with the incorruptible beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is very precious in the sight of God. For in this manner, in former times, the holy women who trusted in God also adorned themselves, being submissive to their own husbands, as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, whose daughters you are if you do good and are not afraid with any terror. Husbands, likewise, dwell with them with understanding giving honor to the wife as to the weaker vessel, and as being heirs together of the grace of life, that your prayers may not be hindered. Finally, all of you be of one mind, having compassion for one another. Love as brothers, be tenderhearted, be courteous, not returning evil for evil or reviling for reviling, but on the contrary, blessing, knowing that you were called to this, that you may inherit a blessing. For he who would love life and see good days let him refrain his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking deceit. Let him turn away from evil and do good. Let him seek peace and pursue it. For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous and his ears are open to their prayers. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. And who is he who will harm you if you become followers of what is good? But even if you should suffer for righteousness' sake, you are blessed. And do not be afraid of their threats, nor be troubled. But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts, and be ready, and always be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks you a reason for the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. Having a good conscience, that when they defame you as evildoers, those who revile your good conduct in Christ may be ashamed. For it is better, if it is the will of God, to suffer for doing good than for doing evil. For Christ also suffered once for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive by the Spirit, by whom also he went and preached to the spirits in prison, who formerly were disobedient, when once the divine lost, the divine long-suffering waited in the days of Noah, while the ark was being prepared, in which a few, that is, eight souls, were saved through water. There is also an antitype which now saves us, baptism, not the removal of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God, through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God, angels and authorities and powers having been made subject to him. So, one of the big topics, as we saw in the first part of um, chapter 3, is husbands and wives. Peter takes time, and it's, I think it sort of, as I was thinking about this just in the New Testament, it's conspicuous to me how important marriage is just in the New Testament. Um, Jesus Christ saying in Matthew 19, there's only one reason that a marriage relationship can be ended, and that's adultery. Only one, right? And I don't know if you remember that record, but then his disciples say, if this is the case, it's really better not to marry. His disciples say that. Why? 
because they had bought into the um, wisdom of the age, so to speak, that it was okay to end the marriage relationship for anything the man decided that it was okay to do that for. Because that was the thinking of the rabbis. You know what? I didn't like that meal. You're gone. Any reason? The disciples had bought into that. So he corrects them there. But then we see in Ephesians 5 that marriage, husband and wife, husbands love your wives as Christ loved the church. Husbands and wives are supposed to be an example of Christ in the church. Colossians 3, I think, is the same records. Here we see it again. And in short, as I was just thinking about this, um, I, I don't think it's possible to overestimate how important the marriage relationship is to God and to the church. Because it's supposed to be the incubator for godliness. It truly is. One man, one woman. First relationship God ever established. Only relationship God ever established between people. Um, I don't think you can overestimate that. And I say that because um, we, as husbands, we have to remind ourselves of that. Because husbands love your wives as Christ loved the church is very sacrificial and I will just say unnatural. That is to say, contrary to the old nature. It is fundamentally sacrificial. And if we're not willing to be fundamentally sacrificial, we're not going to get to Ephesians 5 marriage. We're just not going to get there. So we have to remind ourselves of that as husbands. Um, we're not going to go through and read these scriptures, although they're great scriptures, but we don't need to read through them again. Um, I was... Oh, shoot. I left the article. This, These few statistics that we're going to look at, this represents how attitudes toward marriage in the United States have changed. These are statistics, a few, there were eight total that they cited in this particular study. It was a Pew Research study, dated just about one year ago now, February of 2019. These are some of the ways that attitudes toward marriage have changed. Half of Americans ages 18 and older were married in 2017. A share that has remained relatively stable in recent years, but is down eight percentage points since 1990. So that means in 1990, if there were 50% married in 2017, there were 58% married in 1990. You see it was 8 percentage points higher. The only reason I point that out is, when we see attitudes like this declining or increasing in one, when we see a line of 1990, 58%, 2017, 50. So that means the line was going down like this, right? So you extrapolate that line, and I will say for a generation, and I will also say that the definition of a generation is, I mean, you can negotiate that, but arguably, a generation in God's mind is 40 years. Because that was the time of waiting for the ungodly generation to expire in the wilderness. Okay? So let's say we extrapolate this line of how many people married at 18, we extrapolate that over a generation. It's gone down 8 percentage points in 27 years. So that means it's going to be down another 10 plus percentage points in another generation. That's the progression line of where it's going. Right. Next thing, the number of U.S. adults cohabiting with their partners on the rise, so that's increasing. Right. Support for the legalization of same-sex marriage, that's increasing. Um, the, one of the reasons I pointed out the importance of marriage, how critical it is to God and to the incubation of godliness in, the, in between husband and wife, but also it's supposed to be the, the engine of generating Christianity across generations. It's the family that's supposed to do that. The reason I point that out is, because it is so important, the devil has got to attack it any way he can. And remember, in Genesis 2, it's one man, one woman. You know, a man's going to leave his father and mother, cleave to his wife, the two of you will right? So how does he attack that? Any way he can. Ah, oh, marriage is... Anachronistic. You don't need to just stay with one person anymore. Or same-sex marriage. Why? Because it's not one man and one woman. He attacks it any way that he can. And all of these trend lines are more people are thinking it's okay, fewer people are thinking that it's not. Okay, again, we're, we're related to there, we're talking about this because this is a big topic in 1 Peter chapter 3. First thing he talks about, wives submit, husbands love. First thing he talks about in that chapter. 
And then the last one. Sizable minorities of married people are members of a different religious group than their partner. But marriages and partnerships across political party lines are relatively rare. Now, the article goes on to say that most of the time when they're a different religious group, it's Christians with unaffiliated. So, the whole 1 Corinthians 6.19 argument of not being unequally yoked together with unbelievers is falling out of the boat. People, Christians, don't see the necessity of that. They don't see a need, increasingly, for marrying another Christian. They don't see that iron sharpens iron. They don't see marriage as an incubator for godliness. They don't see marriage as husband and wife are supposed to be an example of Christ in the church. They don't see that. And they see it less and less. So, but I thought it was interesting that political lines, according to this particular statistic, are more important than spiritual lines. It's more important to marry a Republican if you're a Republican than a Christian if you're a Christian. So, I thought about that. I thought, and I look at this from, in my lifetime, when I was a kid, you didn't hear anything about same-sex anything. And I mean nothing. Absolutely nothing. And now, it is all over the place. It's politically incorrect if you don't. So what does that say about how Christians are going to be regarded when they hold to the biblical doctrine of no homosexuality? How are we going to be viewed going forward as these kinds of things get even more popular? Because. Right. Hate speech. But do, do we see the fact that it is being so attacked makes it, um, proves that it is even more important. And that what we can do about it, obviously our own marriages, and then our kids. To, to the end that at any point in our kids' lives we have any avenue of speaking into their lives, anything biblical at all, we need to do that. <clears throat> ever. If we ever have that opportunity, we need to do that. Because... The devil is doing it all the time, man. He's always speaking into their lives. Television, smartphones, radio, World Wide Web, always, 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 always speaking into their lives. Uh, let's see, so 1 Peter um, 3, 10 through 12, um, I've been memorizing scripture, and this is some scripture I've been memorizing, but it basically just talks about and when it says, uh, he will love life and see good, die, good days, let him refrain his tongue. And then there are specific behavioral things to do. Let him refrain his tongue from evil, his lips that they speak no God. How important is the words that we speak? <coughs> let him um, seek peace, uh, eschew evil and, and um, do good. Let him seek peace and ensue it. Right? Specific behavioral things we're supposed to do. Again, just the truth of Becoming Christ-like doesn't just happen spontaneously. There has to be deliberate effort. There are specific things we've got to do. It just doesn't happen because we come to church. It doesn't happen by osmosis. But I, the reason that I many times will come back to this is that I think it's a common misconception among Christians that becoming Christ-like is God's job. It's not God's job. He will always be there. He will always work in you. It's your job to work out. And he tells us that repeatedly. Again and again and again. First um, Peter 3.15 <laughs> Such a great scripture. It's the, but sanctify the Lord God in your hearts. Be ready always to give an answer to every man that asks you with a reason of the hope that's in you to meet this in fear. Um, so a couple of things that I thought of there is just that that word um, give an answer, the word answer is the Greek word apologia. We get the English word apology from it. It's not a good uh, sort of evolution of that word because apologia does not mean apology. It means defense. It means, um, it means sometimes heated defense. You may remember in Acts 21 when Paul is um, mobbed by the Jews. They want to kill him because they think he brought Gentiles into the temple courtyard and they just want to kill him. And the Roman soldiers go in and get him out of the mob, and, and then he's allowed to make a defense to the people, and he starts that chapter by saying, you know, hear my defense. 
That's the word apologia. He sets out in order. Or in 1 Corinthians 9, he also uses it there. Because he's talking about, they accuse him of, uh, he says, you know, have we not power to eat and drink? Have we not power to, power to lead? And here's another one for Peter being married. Have we not power to lead about a sister, a wife, as Barnabas? And I think he specifically mentioned Cephas. Right? So Peter was clearly married. Paul knew that too. But the point, and then he goes on to say, the defense, my defense to those who accuse me is this. It's defense. It's not apology. So when we give an answer, it's not an apology. We don't apologize for the gospel. We defend the gospel. First Corinthians two fifteen or First Peter three fifteen. And the always ready part. Uh, there's nothing special, you know. Those Greek words. You know what always ready means? Always ready. <laughs> nothing special about those words. Just means always ready. And we should be ready. If I ever get an opportunity to share God's word, I should be ready to do that. Whether it's to an individual or to a group, maybe. I should be ready to do that. That's what that verse talks about. Always ready to give an answer to every man. It may be a 30 second answer. It may not involve a whole bunch of um, high flown words, but we should be ready. And then uh, the hope is in you. The hope for all of us, the future event for which we hope is the return of Christ. Again, Peter saw Jesus Christ face to face. He was with Jesus Christ during some of the most significant moments in his ministry. Most notably the Passion, but also the Transfiguration. He saw all this stuff firsthand. So when he thinks about Jesus Christ coming back, he's got a mind picture that we can't begin to reproduce. Because he saw him in the flesh. He saw him ascend. He saw him go up to heaven. But he still desiring that hope, that return. He still has that burning vision 30 years later. And he says, we need to have an answer, you know, an answer ready to every man who asks us about that hope. Well, the first thing we've got to have is that hope. We've got to be hoping, you know, be looking forward to that future event of Jesus Christ returning. Sometimes I think it's easy to forget. And that was all I had on 1 Peter 2 and 3. So I will close with prayer, and then if there's any comments or questions. Heavenly Father, we thank you again for our time here. We thank you for the light of your word. We thank you for giving it to us so that we uh, know how to live. And I thank you again for these men for taking the time to be here, for making Bible study a priority in their lives, in their individual Christian lives. Thank you for these things in the name of Jesus Christ.